Valley. What do you see? In the alley, we're in the mountains. We're in the mountains, girlfriend. Another beautiful sunny day in the Rocky Mountains. Hi everyone, nothing fancy here. I am accompanied by my faithful companion, Allie the Mountain Dog. She's snapping at flies over here, kind of busy. Getting them, girlfriend? We are in the great Rocky Mountains as we often like to find ourselves adventuring. There's some beautiful quaking aspens in their summertime colors, some spruce trees in the background. What a gorgeous setting this is. In the background, even further off in the distance, you see the glacier on that mountain down yonder. I'm pretty general where I am because I don't like lots of people showing up to my favorite places. Sorry. Trust me, the Rocky Mountains around 9,000 feet elevation. And yeah, we come out here to do all kinds of things. We'll do knife reviews, gear reviews, uh, backpacking style stuff. And that's kind of why we're here today. Uh, not kind of. That's actually why we're here. And it's taken me a long time to prepare this series of videos. Welcome to Nut and Fancy's buying advice on backpacking style of tents. We may cover other tents as we go along. It's taken me a long time to prepare for this. Probably about a year. Um, just getting several tents together to show you guys. Finding the right location to set these tents up as we discuss in great detail all the features. And there's lots of information I got to impart to you. Uh, sometimes when you go to a store, you know, you may or may not find someone who knows about tents. And again, I'm not going to say that I'm the end-all expert. I'm not going to say that my experience and my preferences when it comes to tents is exactly right. But I will say this, uh, it's based on a lot of experiences in places like this, in all kinds of weather. Rain, snow, sun dating all the way back to the 70s and so what I'm going to show show you and tell you in this series of videos I don't know how long they'll be or how many there will be um, is I'm just going to share that advice and that experience with you again your mileage may vary if some armchair leaders show up and criticize me on this or that uh, I'll say what I always say if you felt strongly about the topic at can't uh, excuse me the topic at hand you would have had your own series of videos on this dating before mine Lots to discuss, let's get going. No doubt it would be a lot easier for Ali and I to do these series of videos on tents at our homestead. Or maybe find someone's big old backyard, do the setup back there. And it'd actually probably be uh, more of a controlled environment too, as far as the wind, the weather goes. But I've chosen this Alpine location on purpose, made the long trek to get up here, because one, it's beautiful. It's a gorgeous place to review tents like that and show you guys the actual setting where I use my gear. This is it. Um, very similar. If it's not exactly like this, it's very similar. High altitude. Usually I've carried my own uh, backpack with me and a tent like that North Face 33 sitting there in the background along with me. Uh, and also these elements like the weather, the wind, and the bugs which are everywhere today um, we can incorporate those things into the reviews as we go, and they're actually present at this location. Just a gorgeous area. Look at this big old sucker that just landed. Speaking of bugs, this is what I'm talking about. Look at that sucker. He's getting ready to die, by the way. Watch this. He's going to die. The sucker going to die. Oh, dead. Miyagi would have been proud. Killed that. Totally wasted that thing. Allie's killed about a thousand flies on her own. I probably have to zip her up in a tent, give her some uh, rest from these bugs. And of all the things I brought, I forgot the bug juice. That sucks. So we're just going to have to suffer through it. we got to get through this review. A couple ground rules as I go along here. Uh, first off, guys that have found me probably wonder who I am. I'm not talking about my faithful TMPers. Love you guys. Salute. Uh, but maybe some people off the internet through Google found me. Uh, my background is I'm just an outdoors guy. You know, uh, all types of gear. Guns, knives, mountaineering equipment, backpacking equipment, dating, like I said in the beginning, all the way back to the 1970s. 
Uh, not that I'm any better than anybody else, but I have a lot of experience in this stuff. And yes, it does form the basis for my own opinions and the stuff I'll tell you. Also, I was an L.L. Bean field tester for a number of years. And the way I got into that, strangely enough, is through tents. I actually wrote like a seven-page letter. You heard that, right? A seven-page letter. Sent it out to a number of manufacturers to include L.L. Bean, Eureka, Marmot, oh gosh, all kinds. Mountain Hardware, the North Face. Several of them responded back. Um, the letter dealt with features in tents that I just was not seeing in the market. Things that I thought could uh, be good uh, additions to the future lines of tents they were going to come out with. Uh, Ella Bean in, in particular really liked what I had to say and it was through that exchange and the conversations we had with their field testing department that I became an LL Bean field tester and I did that. I'm actually on sabbatical with them. I could go back any time but with that fancy project and my other commitments with my jobs I just don't do it anymore. So that's a little bit of background of where I'm coming from. Also guys we're not in a photo studio as you can tell. With all the bugs swarming around us, yeah we're going to have to contend with those. The wind will kick up once in a while. Dudes, it's the guy out of doors. It's Rocky Mountains. It's just what we put up with. Yeah, my my face will be in shadow oftentimes, but I love the location. We can roll these elements in to the review as it progresses, like the bugs, and talk about you know how to shelter yourself from the bugs and some tips of use that I'll come to later in the series, uh, things that I've learned as we go. Okay, um, I have four tents set up here. They are representative for four of the categories which I um, which I've come up with. By the way, I haven't gone to any other website. I haven't uh, adopted any other uh, any other uh, reviewers' way of doing things. These are my own ways of categorizing the tents and my own POUs or philosophies of use. I'll get into those. Behind me is the North Face 33. That is very representative, by the way, of a three-season large tent. Maybe maybe uh, able to flex into perhaps a winter and mountaineering variety of tent depending on how you guide out and what kind of snow load you can expect for it. That's one of the categories. Another one behind uh, the tripod which I'll just show you, uh, I'll just put a video clip in there, is a Kelty Gunnison 2. That's an excellent example of a three season small tent what a lot of people call two person tent or two man tent. I call them small because they are that. They're very compact. It's hard to fit stuff and gear in them but they're lightweight more portable. Okay, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. Then a uh, free season family camping tent. I don't have one of those set up. Um, I may refer to it as we go. Actually, I know I will, at least the REI version of it. These are more kind of like car camping tents that you would take with you in a vehicle. The three seasons small, the three seasons large to include the Boulder, 33 behind me, no longer in production, sorry. Um, those are backpacking tents. These are tents you can put on your, your back, haul it into a location like this, set it up and therefore the lightweight aspects of the tent, the compactability of the tent are very important. And that's kind of what the focus on this series of videos is. Is I want it to be small, lightweight, and yet have lots of capabilities for what we've carried in. Then we have minimalist small tents. I don't have any of those set up because I think they suck. Um, yes, there are certain areas where these will excel. There are certain people who will like these. I don't mean to offend anybody who's a big fan of them. And I'm talking about like bivy sacks or tube tents, the really small ones where you have to be like prone to fit into them. I've tried them and I haven't liked them. You can't change clothes in them. If you get stuck in a rainstorm, you're going to be stuck in them for, you know, days, hours, you know, or hours turning into days. They blow. Um, so no, I don't have any set up because I don't recommend them. You know, are there certain times when they would be suitable? Yeah, probably. You know, if you're doing a really high speed or long hike, like doing, you know, 40 miles a day, and you really have to watch all the ounces, all the weight, then yeah, a minimalist tent is the way to go. Or a minimalist tent could be like a tarp where you don't have a bottom at all. And some of these ones that I have set up here uh, could function that way too, where I would just pitch the tarp uh, or a variation thereof, and we wouldn't pitch the tent body and just sleep on the ground. Again, I don't recommend that either. I like sleeping comfortable. I don't like getting ate up by the bugs, which you see swarming around my ugly face right now. So, uh, yeah, it blows. Uh, base camp or family tents. I want to call them base camp tents. This is a special type of tent that's a large, very strong tent intended to function as a base camp, probably for summit attempts. Uh, maybe like Everest K2. These are very expensive tents. They're very well built. They're very heavy. 
Um, they're very wind resistant, snow resistant. These are base camp temps. No, I don't have one set up here because I don't need them. It's too much weight, too much strength for my own POU. Um, now, if I ever do an attempt on K2, then yeah, I'll look into getting a base tent, uh, base camp tent and get it. Not to say that a tent like this couldn't function in it, but it's just not rising to that level of strength, which yes, we'll talk about. Then we have ultralights. Um, ultralights kind of fall into a category of single wall tents that uh, have just that, just a single wall, no fly. I uh, don't have any of those because I'm not a fan of those either. I've tried them. I've slept in them and they condensate a lot. They don't ventilate well. They're not comfortable. Yes, they're lightweight. Generally more roomy than uh, a traditional tent of equal weight and size. But those are the categories. Um, and I'll remind you of these as we go along. So let's get going. I'm going to break it down in categories. Of, like I said, there may be some redundancy. There's that wind I told you about. It's picking up. There may be some redundancy in these categories as I go. Um, they're going to include firepower versus mobility, impact, livability. There's lots of subcategories under that one. Design features that I like again. Buying sources. Uh, I'll kind of integrate that as we go along. My own tips for use that I've learned. Longevity and then aspects of strength of certain tent designs. Okay, let's go. The first thing I recommend you do as a tent user is really nail down your philosophy of use. How do you intend on using it? If you're a vehicle camper, maybe in a car, a truck, an ATV, your options open up considerably. You know, maybe you can go out and get a 25, 30 pound tent, carry it in your vehicle, and then pitch it when you get to where you're going. You didn't have to haul it in on your back, you drove it in with your vehicle. Um, in that POU, uh, you can get a really nice big tent that has multiple rooms, very lodge-like, vertical walls, you know, tons of floor space, huge headroom, big old vestibules for your gear, great tent, you know, and a great big tent. And there's lots of different options out there from a lot of different manufacturers that will serve in that capacity. Cabela's, Kelty, REI, they all make great options in the car camping style of tent. In the Nut and Fancy Project though, we generally are not car campers, we're backpackers. We're hauling in all the stuff we need for our adventure on our backs just like I talked about in my series of vids last year extended stay backpacking videos you'll see it in annotation there in that POU weight and size are very critical you can't take the kitchen sink with you you're going to have to make some compromises um, in your choice of tents a lot of guys right off will say well I only want to buy one tent I want it to serve in every possible environment and climate that I go uh, I won't say you can't do that, you can do it, but you're going to live with certain compromises. A good example of this would be maybe a mountaineering tent. Some guy says, well, you know, I want a really strong tent that can really take a lot of snow loads because I will go snowshoeing, maybe I'll go, you know, uh, cross-country skiing, I want that tent to come with me when I do it. Great. That tent for three adults, specifically, you know, guys over six feet tall, is probably going to weigh about 12 pounds of a conventional design. In other words, a double wall tent that has a fly and a body. A uh, single wall variety you might get less, maybe eight pounds, uh, maybe six, just depends. But generally if you go with a mountaineering style of tent, you're going to give up something in ventilation in order to get that strength for the snow loads that the designers were striving for. And speaking of designers, they have it really tough. Um, in order to make a good or excellent backpacking tent, which by the way this North Face 33 is, in the category of three season, um, uh, three season large tents, it's outstanding. Um, but to get all the things right that they got, it's tough. I mean, you got to make a tent uh, breathable, you know, strong, able to withstand snow loads, perhaps even a three season, because you never know when it's going to snow. At least in the fall, uh, it has to be good looking, attractive to the customer, it has to be breathable, ventilate well. Um, it has to have good floor layout that's usable space for the users and occupants that they can stretch out, fit all their gear, the vestibule design. You know, that in and of itself is, a, uh, is kind of a design compromise. And you have to fit all these features and all these th things into a, a tent that weighs around seven pounds. Uh, maybe less, maybe more. Um, in my experience, you're going to be looking at a three season large style of tent weighing around eight pounds. We'll get to more of the weight here in a bit. Um, realistically, when you add in the vestibule, the rain fly, 
maybe a ground cloth that I recommend you make on your own as I'll show you. Uh, upgraded stakes, uh, you're probably going to be around eight, eight and a half pounds, maybe nine pounds. But if you have multiple people in your group, you can separate that carry weight into different you know, backpacks and doable. And when you get where you're going, you have a tent like this. Spacious, large, comfortable, ventilates well, really well, uh, really excellent. But it does weigh more. On the flip side, some guys will say, well, you know, I want a minimalist tent. I, I want a tent that weighs two pounds and fits like five dudes. <laughs> I've talked to guys like that. Unrealistic. You're not going to get that. You're basically going to be sleeping out under the stars, maybe pit, you know, uh, pitch a tarp, sleep under that. You can do that. You're going to give up a lot of comfort, bug protection, you know, and all the other stuff. Uh, I Again, like I said before, I don't like that. I like a real tent because it's like a home, home away from home. It's just a really comfortable way to spend your time in the backcountry, especially when you bivouac camp like I do. And you may stay in an area for multiple uh, days on end. You want a tent like this. So makers are always striving to maximize space and minimize weight in their backpacking tent. There's different ways they've used to do this throughout the years. I'll show you as we talk about the features. And it will probably change as years go on, both in terms of design and materials used. And there might be some revolutionary materials that will arrive on scene that will change all the criteria I'm talking about. I will say this though, in the last 20 years I ain't seen it. It's still nylon, it's still aluminum, and it basically boils down to design uh, that the manufacturer uses. So all of this really boils down to what I always say, firepower versus mobility. Whether I'm talking about a knife review, a gun review, a tactical gear item review, or in this case, tents, it still plays and it's still basically the same concept. Uh, in terms of firepower, when we're talking about tents, again, that might be termed uh, you know, waterproofness, weatherproofness, the ability to withstand big old wind and snow loads. Perhaps it means uh, I want a very spacious tent where I have tons of room to stretch out. You can get those things, but it's going to come at an, a price, and that price is probably going to be weight and probably size. It's going to weigh a lot and be bulkier. If you're on the other side of the equation, maybe you really want to put your emphasis on mobility, great. Just understand you're going to also, on that side of the spectrum, make some compromises as well. Maybe in terms of comfort, convenience features, uh, the ability uh, to handle a lot amount or a large amount of gear and people, i.e. floor space, it's just going to be limited. Firepower versus mobility, you're going to have to decide what's most important to you. On to the specifics. First up, color choice, or as I call it, impact. I, nothing fancy, like low impact colors for several different reasons. The first kind of drives to the heart of my own philosophy of use. In other words, I am a bivouac style of backpacker. I like backpacking in perhaps a long distance to a location that's beautiful, maybe a high mountain lake area, and establishing a bivouac or base camp. And from that uh, bivouac area, I'll go out and do my adventuring. Maybe it's day hikes, fishing, and then coming back to base camp. That's just the way I like it. I've done through camping too, and I'll probably do it in the future, but generally that's what I do. If I have a base camp, I don't want it to be readily seen by anyone in the area because I may not be there, and there may be gear stored at my base camp, maybe in the tent, maybe in the surrounding area. If I have an orange or yellow tent, that base camp stands out from a long ways away. People can see it. Um, yes, I know most people who will go to that much effort to backpack into the backcountry are good folks. They're probably not going to rip you off, but they're not all good, and there's, you can find thieves everywhere. And so if I, my base camp st stands out due to the, uh, you know, my color choice of tent, it kind of puts my, uh, my gear at risk from getting ripped off. You see where I'm going? Uh, another thing is, it's just consideration for others. Uh, you know, when I get to an area where I think I'm going to be all alone, I look around and I see that there's, you know, five yellow and orange tents around that I can readily see. I don't dig it. I don't like it. Because um, here I thought I was in an area that was pristine, remote, there weren't going to be a lot of people, and lo and behold, I, there are a lot of people. I know because I can readily see their camps. Uh, that doesn't mean that there won't be the same number of people. It just means that out of consideration for others, I think it is kind of cool to blend in with your environment. Um, again, it's just me. That's what I like to do. Uh, and the third reason is kind of drives to maybe WROL. 
uh, without rule of law. If I ever have to employ a tent like this in that situation, uh, I don't want an orange or red tent. You know, my, I may have to skedaddle to some remote place. My family and I, my friends, I might be using that tent and that POU as a survival tent. And the last thing I want is to have something loud, like orange or red, that's just like shouting to the world, hey, here we are, come over here. You know, and then I've got hassles and security concerns I have to deal with, you see? So, low impact colors. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be camouflaged. Uh, there are some tents out there that are indeed camouflaged, and I think they're great. Uh, one of my favorite patterns, of course, is multicam. And I would love to see a tent like this made in multicam. Uh, because it's very low impact, it's very suitable to a wide variety of terrains, both alpine, maybe desert, uh, maybe even swamp areas. Of course, you find a dry place for that. Um, so a wide variety of environments, multicam would serve well. ACU, another good color. Uh, Brigade Quartermaster through the years has marketed such tents. I'm not sure how they sell. I think with the general buying public, they do not sell well uh, because people don't want that. You know, if they pitch a, a tent that has a camo pattern on them, a lot of people are afraid they'll look, they'll look like a survivalist or something. You know, whatever. But some other good low impact colors are tans. Maybe some light tans. Uh, they blend well with a wide variety of environments to include maybe uh, you know the quaking aspens and spruces we find ourselves at here in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, maybe in the southeast and northwest. It does well. Tans are some of my favorites. Um, and they also have the ad added advantage of being very cheery inside. Uh, that might be a disadvantage to camouflage patterns. Uh, keep in mind that as that light comes through and filters through the tent, it kind of gets to your livability concerns. In other words, if it's a dark color, like a real dark green, and again, that sear designs with the fly on is just such a tent. It's kind of drab inside. It's not cheery. A tan, it still blends in, and it's also very cheery and light when the sun filters through. Another consideration. Uh, light, light greens, moss colors are also excellent. Um, as are grays. Believe it or not, grays are a very subdued color, and at distance, they blend in very nicely. Uh, the very bark of these uh, quaking aspen trees you see around me are what color? Light gray. And so a tent at distance, if it's gray, will blend in kind of nice. Keep in mind the tent body and the tent fly can be two different colors, and you need to be aware of that. Look very carefully at the tent fly. You may have a really cool tent body color. It might be a light tan, light gray, something very subdued and versatile. And then you throw the fly on, it's yellow you know, or purple or orange or something ridiculous like that where uh, it's just going to ruin your intended purpose. Uh, and most often, the tent you see behind me and the others I have now, due to our features review that we're going to go over, are not wearing their flies. But most often, in when I'm pitched at my base camp, they do have their flies on. Because almost always, I get rained on. And I immediately just put my fly on so I'm prepared and I don't have to do it in the rain. There are some upsides to bright colors, whether it's an orange or really bright yellow, like North Face likes to use. <clears throat> and that is they make really good base camp tents. In that POU, I want my base camp to be very visible because I might just be hiking back to it in a driving snowstorm or blizzard. Uh, in that POU, subdued colors don't work and they're not advised. Uh, a yellow and orange are great and they'll function perfectly. And not always will you want to be subdued. There might be an area or you might have an outing with a group of people where you want your base camp to be very visible to everyone around you. Get an orange, get, an, get a yellow, and they'll function well. And there's a lot of great ones out there. Some examples currently, and again, this is always subject to change. It's just a snapshot in time. Might be the Marmot Limelight 3. That's a very bright, brightly colored tent. Really a good design, a very visible and also the Marmot Aero Spree. Another handsome tent, brightly colored, very visible, in a mountaineering POU, in a snowy environment, those might be the good color choices to go with. But generally speaking, me not fancy, I go with a low impact color choice for my tents. Safe and sound within our tent. Checking out the wind driving those beautiful quaking aspens in our high alpine environment. It is a cool feeling after a long backpack in to set up your tent, 
get your sleeping bag set up, and just enjoy your home away from home. Because that's what your tent is. It's your home, and it can be, and has been at least for the Nut and Fancy Clan for as long as a week on end. And that will take us to the all-important category of livability. First up, subcategory, floor plan. And don't underestimate its importance. You really need to figure out what floor plan, how big it will be, and what its shape will be, um, and how it will intermesh with your occupants. Me, I like rectangular floor plans. I don't mind a geodesic tent, and that's basically what the Boulder 33 is. It's a modification on a geodesic design. So it's not a purely rectangular floor plan. See how it kind of angles out there on the side. But overall, it has the usefulness and utility of a rectangle. And that drives to the heart of how comfortable your tent will be. And again, don't underestimate it. Livability and specifically the floor plan is huge. Because you just may be stuck in your tent for days on end. I know, been there, done it. Uh, on one North Carolina outing with my buddy, this was a long time ago, we got stuck in a little A-frame tent that pretty much sucked. Uh, wasn't waterproof, wasn't weatherproof. Everything we had inside got drenched uh, for two days. We rode it out. And it was cramped. It had a very tiny floor on it. We had all our gear, and both of us in there, and it was just miserable. And from that experience, I said, you know what? My tents in the future are going to be good. And they're going to be squared away and big enough for my occupants. So the floor plan, very, very important consideration. When it comes to tent ratings, don't believe what you hear. Uh, you know, you may have heard that two is one, three is two, and four is three. And it may be pertaining to guns or knives, but definitely applies to tents. In other words, if they say it's a two-man tent, it basically is a one-man tent. If they say it's a three-man tent, it's a two-man tent. Four, three-man. Follow? That's because they're very optimistic on their ratings. Um, they probably rate the North Face, uh, this Boulder uh, 33 by North Face, as a four-man tent. No way, man. It is a comfortable two-man tent. Uh, now, I stretch it and say that it's a three-season large variety of tent, um, but two guys with their gear, six-foot-plus type of guys, fit pretty good within this style of tent. When considering your gear that your tent will have to accommodate and the occupants, be generous. You're probably going to run out of space before you know it. Uh, for me, 40 square feet is generally my minimum acceptable for a two-person tent. 40 plus square feet. And I'm just talking about the body of the tent itself. I'd prefer to have 47 if I can get it as long as the weight doesn't go out of control. This Boulder 33 is 41 square feet, tent body only. The reason I need that room is for the gear and for the occupants. And be realistic when you make those assessments, guys. Uh, you're probably going to run out of space before you know it. For me, I need room to store two sleeping bags. They're associated sleeping pads, clothing, maybe food in the side pockets if I'm not in bear country. Lighting, maybe some knives, maybe some guns on the side. If I'm winter camping, the boots come inside so they can get warm. They might be under the vestibule. They might not be. Uh, but winter clothing is very bulky, takes up a lot of room. And yeah, I like it in the tent where it's warmest, especially if it got you know wet during the day. Maybe, just maybe, I can dry it out as the day goes on. So be realistic in that assessment. 40 square feet of the tent itself is my minimal acceptable for a two-person tent, which is again, can't speak, which again, most manufacturers call a four-person tent. Vertical walls really help the comfort factor within the tent. As you can see, the Boulder 33 uses an outside hoop. See that blue one right there? What that does is it serves to stretch that wall outward and creates more of a vertical living space. Therefore, the tent wall stands up and it gives you so much room, more room to change clothes, to just sit and talk and enjoy the day, especially again if you're stuck in a driving rainstorm. Vertical walls help. They might come at a slight decrease in stability. In other words, if I have a 50 knot wind hitting that vertical wall, I'm going to have to spend some time guy lining the side of that tent to strengthen it so it can withstand it. 
But give me a vertical wall, I'm pretty happy because it really increases and improves the livability within the, within the tent. Note the length and the width of your floor plan. This is huge, especially if you're kind of tall like I am. I'm six foot three inches, therefore I cannot take any tent that's more or shorter than 90 inches, nine zero inches. If you're short, maybe five five around there, your options for backpacking tents will open up a lot. A lot of guys will say, what, Matt, what difference does it make? As long as I can fit within the tent, I'm good to go. Wrong. You're not good to go, and here's why. Here comes an experience tip from Nut and Fancy. And I'm going to use a sleeping bag as an example. You don't want your sleeping bag touching the sides of the wall if you can possibly prevent that. And that's because the walls of your tent, even despite your best efforts, are probably, probably going to be coated with condensation in the morning. Especially in the fall and the winter. As you can see now, this is a dry tent because it's the middle of summer and I have the fly off. So we have excellent ventilation through the top mesh. However, as you breathe during the night, you will condensate a lot. Uh, in other words, you just breathe out moisture. And that moisture has to go somewhere and it usually, in my experience, ends up on the uncoated portion of the nylon of the tent. And if your sleeping bag is rubbing against that, especially if they did down sleeping bag, then you're, you're going to have problems because you just got your down wet. And if you're in a winter camping environment, you have problems. Good luck trying to dry that down sleeping bag out during your winter camp out. Therefore, getting back to floor plan, the width and the length that will accommodate your size of sleeping bag and your stature is very important. If you can keep your sleeping bag away from the walls, and I'm talking about the ends of the the tent too, you're going to sleep a lot drier and you're going to keep your bag drier, especially in consideration with those down sleeping bags.